But I want to begin with a passage out of Isaiah chapter 46, and let me give you the context. Uh, God is saying in relationship to the other gods, Baal and, and the other idols and the deities, that not only Israel sometimes falls into the trap of worshiping, but some of the other uh, countries around them worship the false gods. And he's trying to set himself apart, which is not very hard, right, from all the other little G gods or the idols of the other nations. Verse 9, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Now look at the beginning of verse 10 there. He says, declaring the end from the beginning. Now Genesis, the, the word literally means beginning. And so God is saying, I'm going to declare uh, the end from the beginning. So can we learn, uh, and, and let me just relate back to Daniel. Most of us remember that much of Daniel was about the end times, right? He, he was very prophetic. So now God is saying, if you want to know something about the end, study the beginning. That's interesting, isn't it? If you want to understand the end, study the beginning and you would think no i don't want to stu study the beginning i want to study the ending but this is what he says i'm the kind of god that stands alone all these other deities these idols are not gods he said i am god there's none like me and one of his uh, uh, i guess lines on his resume if god has a resume is that i can tell you how this is going to end from the beginning and so that's what he tells us. And he says, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. So he says, I'm going to tell you how this is going to begin. And in the beginning, it's going to have a little bit of, to do about the ending. And I'll end this the way that I say it will end. And we've, we've talked about this a lot of times. You know, you, you watch the news, and you, you hear some of the talking heads. Well, we're going to kill each other in nuclear war. We're going to have global warming and... You know, Ocasio-Cortez tells us uh, that we only have 12 years to live. And how uh, do you know none of that is true? God will end this the way he says it will end. And so that's what he's saying. So let's begin at the beginning. If you have Genesis, turn over there. Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So... What I've done here is give you a, a little bit of uh, Hebrew. And something about Hebrew is that Hebrew is written much different than we write Hebrew. Um, but notice the first letter in your Bible. It is the letter bet, and some pronounce it bait. The first letter in the Hebrew alphabet is uh, uh, aleph, and the second one is bet. So you know what we get from that, the alpha bet. So that's where that term comes from. It is very Hebrew. So if you look at the first symbol or letter in the Bible, it is that symbol of bet. Now, if you notice the shape, and there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, but uh, of all the, uh, the letters, he begins with this one. If you notice that shape of bet, it only opens up to the left. And Hebrew is written from the right to the left. We write from the left to the right, but Hebrew writes from the right to the left. So this is what the Hebrew scholars say. That if you look at the beginning of the Bible, the letter bet, it is closed off from above, it is closed off from below, and it's closed off from the right. It only opens to the left, and that's the way it's written from left, from right to left. So if you're there looking at bet, it only goes to the left of that symbol. And they say we can only understand and learn from that point on because everything else is closed off. It's closed off from the top, the bottom, and the right, and it only opens up as it is written from that point on. So when you ask the question, or a child asks the question, or I ask the question, uh, where did God come from? Everything for us is closed off to the right, the top, and the bottom, 
It only starts right there and it opens up. So it is uh, very interesting that that, uh, that letter, that symbol, is the beginning of the Bible. So he says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So to have creation, you have to have certain things. Now, this is not just biblical. This is also scientific. You have to have time. You have to have space. You have to have matter. And you have to have energy. So time, space, matter, and energy. So you have to have those things and have to have that cause to initiate the event. So if we reread this and putting those factors into creation... Watch this. In the beginning, that's time. God, who is all-powerful, that's energy, created the heaven, which is space, and the earth, which is matter. So you have time, energy, space, and matter. And nearly all scientists will tell you, you have to have those four components for anything to be made or created. And so in the first line of the Bible... We have time, energy, space, and matter. Isn't that interesting that that actually complies with scientific study? Now, there's a Latin phrase that many of you know. It's called ex nihilo. It's N-I-H-I-L-O, which means out of nothing. So we can, from our Christian perspective, say that God created the heavens and the earth out of nothing that we know of. And by faith, he created it. But if you take it from a evolutionist or someone who's not a Christian, then they're also in the same mindset that we are, that they would say, well, something happened here, and we have the universe as we know it, but we don't know where it came from. And here's some of the variations of the thought. Well, it was always into existence, or it just created itself, something happened, but the... <laughs> The prime suspect here is, you know, if it did create from nothing, where did the something from nothing come out of? Does that make sense to you? So for our belief, we believe there is a loving creator God who spoke the world into existence, and he spoke it from our uh, vantage point out of nothing. Now, go back with me, and we're going to look at Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 again. And he says, declaring the end from the beginning... And from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So I believe, now this is my opinion, and I believe my opinion is right, and um, we'll go from that premise, that every major doctrine in your Bible is found in the book of Genesis. That every major doctrine in your Bible is found in the book of Genesis. Now it's found in shadows and types and in stories, and events, and when I say story, I don't mean a myth, but I mean an actual account that's been handed down through the ages. Um, we, we can look at the rapture. How many of you know the rapture is actually in Genesis? We, we can look at the, the Lord destroying the earth. It's actually in Genesis. We can look at a father offering his son to be sacrificed. It's actually in Genesis. We see a young man who's hated by his brothers. But yet he rises to the side of the throne. It's actually in Genesis. So all of these major doctrines are in the book of Genesis. And so for the next few weeks, what we're going to do, we're going to look at those and say, okay, what is God saying? And if we look back to Isaiah 49, he says, we're going to go back to the beginning. And the beginning is going to tell you about how this is going to end and how this is going to unfold. So I think it's going to be very interesting, and hopefully you will be with us as we uh, uh, go through this in the study of Genesis. And of course, Dr. Jeff will be teaching also. Um, one, one of the great things for me, and, and I don't know about you, but one of the great things for me, and matter of fact, Stephen just shared that with me earlier. He said, one of the things that we love coming about here is you actually learn something about the Bible. <laughs> Isn't that an odd thing about church? You actually learn something from the Bible that we can keep learning, keep growing, and still getting deeper. Uh, Paul said in the New Testament, if anybody thinks they know something, they don't know anything like they should. So uh, we're, we're always learning, right? Okay, let's go back. Genesis 1, we're going to do 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness covered 
or was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So let's look at this word earth. So we're going to break this down so we can all have a little bit more knowledge and understanding. Uh, the earth was without form. That word means nothingness, chaotic and primeval. Void, it means empty and wasteland. And then he uses the term the face of the deep, or the deep is the abyss, the primeval ocean. So we believe at one time the earth was totally covered by water. Scientists believe at one time the earth was totally covered by water. And uh, that's interesting because the Bible says the earth was totally covered by water. And so we, we had already known that. Then he says darkness is covering the face of the deep. And then the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. And the word move means to flutter, softly falling, or hovering. This word is used again as an illustration of how God leads Israel. It's found over uh, in their plight from Egypt to the Promised Land. And he said, I led you like an eagle would flutter over her young. It's the same word here in Genesis that's used in that word. So when it says the Spirit moved over the face of the water or hovered over the face of the water, it refers to almost like a chicken or a bird would hover over the nest, hatching out and leading and teaching the, the young birds, the, the chicks. So we, we have the Holy Spirit hovering, fluttering over this abyss. Now look at verse 3. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, the darkness he called night. So evening and morning were the first day. Now if you look at the last line in the Hebrew culture, their day actually starts at evening, and it doesn't start in the morning. When we flew into Israel a few years ago, uh, we flew in, uh, I believe it was on a Friday, and that Friday evening everything began to shut down because the Sabbath is on Saturday, so they actually began preparing for the Sabbath the evening before because that was their custom. And it didn't say morning and evening. If you look there, it says what? Evening and morning. That was called the first day. So God brings forth a light, and this is a supernatural light that comes from God himself. Now the natural light, uh, such as the stars, the sun, and the reflective light of the moon, do not appear until day four. So there's light in the universe, but there's no stars, there's no sun, there's no moon. So the only light that we know of is the sun, the stars, the reflective light of the moon, and artificial light that we create through technology and through invention. But in that beginning of creation, the light acts absolutely comes from God. It, it's not something that comes from creation as far as sun, moon, stars. Now, something I noticed today that uh, God did not create the darkness, did he? The darkness is there, but he did not create it. And he spoke light into the universe, and it appears that darkness was already present and that once he spoke the light, the darkness begins to flee. So we can take this, the absence of God, there's just darkness, right? So the method of creation is now revealed. The words, God said. So how did he create everything? He created it by speaking. God said it appears ten times in chapter 1. He said, God said, eight times in the creation process. Now, he said uh, other things, but eight times it was in the creation process, and uh, two times he was speaking to his creation. Not speaking it to existence, but just speaking to it and blessing it and saying to be fruitful and multiply. So the method of creation is God speaking. Now, Hebrews 11 gives us insight on that. Verse 3 by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So God, by his word, produced everything in the universe by just speaking it into existence. Now, you and I cannot verify that, but we believe it by faith. We believe what the word of God says. So God spoke, things begin to appear, 
and he creates. I want to give you a quote, and, and I don't really know who said this, but someone said, what we see in the beginning of Genesis is not history, it's not science, it's not mythology, it's revelation. That's a huge quote. Th this is not history, it's not science, it's not mythology, it's revelation. So everything that we know is revelatory because we, we have no history beyond the beginning. The, the, this cannot really be proved scientifically by us, even though there are some scientific facts here. It's not mythology. Now when I say it's not mythology, nearly every culture has a creation story. And if you go back and look at much of the creation stories, there is an element of similarity to almost every creation story. And I wonder why. Because over the period of years from Adam, then this story of creation has been morphed to different times and cultures, but there's an element of similarity to almost every creation story because there is a similar beginning, even though it may have morphed or changed uh, over the years. So something else to note in Genesis 1, and Dr. Jeff taught on this uh, several months ago, Every reference to God in Genesis 1 is the Hebrew word Elohim. It's pronounced Elohim. Elohim occurs 32 times in chapter 1. Elohim is the plural form of El, uh, which is one of the oldest terms for God or divinity. Uh, you know, we have El Shaddai and, you know, all those Els for the names of God. Now, the plural form is not to indicate a belief in many gods or polytheism. But it reveals God's creative power, His uh, sovereignty, His, his, uh, um, his strength. It also reveals what we know as the Godhead. The Godhead is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, there are not three gods. There's only one God. Deuteronomy um, uh, 6 and 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. But it gives us the threefold nature of God. And that threefold nature of God is being revealed in just the title and the name of God throughout Genesis, and especially here in chapter 1, Elohim. So God is threefold in nature, and we can see this in the creation process itself. So God creates by speaking. So he speaks the word, and then once we have part of that creation coming forth, then it says the Spirit of God hovers over what was created now in the hebrew that is the ruach of elohim which means the spirit of elohim or the spirit of god so if you would allow me now to go to the last chapter of the bible so we're in the first we're going to make a little switch here we'll go to the last chapter of the bible and i want you to see some similarities here that are very very important so let's look at revelation 22 this is the last chapter of your Bible, and we're going to just kind of go to the beginning of it. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face. His name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp, nor light of sun. For the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So if we compare the first chapter of the Bible to the last chapter of the Bible, then this is what we have. We have God speaking the word. We have the Spirit of God hovering and then if you look at the first line or two of the last chapter of the Bible, then we see the river of the water of life. Everybody see that in, in that chapter? We see the throne of God and the Lamb. Not thrones, plural, but how many thrones? There's one because it's not a plural word. Um, you say, well, Pastor, I, I see in Genesis, I see God speaking the word. I see the Spirit hovering. Now I see the throne of God and the Lamb. Uh, where's the Holy Spirit? Look, look at the line, the river of life flowing from the throne. Does everybody see that? So 
Jesus stands up the last day of the feast, and he cries out with a loud voice. And he begins to talk about coming and drinking. Then he uses this line, Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And the Bible says this he spoke of, of the Spirit which had not been yet given, but he's talking about the Holy Spirit. So when you look at the beginning of your Bible, you see God speaking the Word, the Holy Spirit hovering. The last chapter of your Bible, you see the river coming from the throne, and the throne is the throne of God and the Lamb. How many of you see the similarities there? So this is what God said. When I give you the beginning, you're going to have to realize you're going to be understanding the ending also when you study the beginning. It's very reminiscent of the, the verse in uh, Ecclesiastes 1 and 9. He said, that which has been done is that which shall be done. He said, if you want to know what I'm going to do in the future, then you look at what I've done in the past. So it's very important to understand that. So we see the river of the water of life. We see the throne of God and the Lamb. Guess what else we see there in that last chapter? We see the tree of life. I don't even know the tree of life is first introduced to us in the book of Genesis. But we also see it in the last chapter of the Bible. He says there'll be no more curse. So when did the curse come? The curse came in the beginning of your Bible. And at the beginning there was no curse until Adam and Eve sinned. And then we have the curse. And now at the last chapter of the Bible, he says there will be no more curse. He says God will be present with you. So the presence of God will be with them. Guess what happened at the beginning of the Bible? Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the evening in the garden, and they walked in His presence, and His presence was with them. Then it says, we will see His face, and I am pretty much assured in my mind that they saw the face of God in the sense that they saw someone with them in the garden. He says, there will be no more night or darkness, he said, you will not need a lamp, artificial light, or the sun, because the Lord gives the light. So remember, the light came first before there was a sun, a moon, or stars. So God had light in the universe, and guess what? When this is all over, uh, let me give you a good Oklahoma term, when this shooting match is over, uh, when we're done here, and we're in eternity with God, we will not have to have a sun or a moon, or artificial light, because what does the Bible say? say? That God's going to be the light, and other verses says the Lamb is going to be the light in that city. So uh, God himself will radiate the, the city of God and, and the universe, just like he did in Genesis chapter 1. So there's a lot of parallels there, aren't there? And really there's more parallels than sometimes we even think that there are. So Genesis chapter 1, let's go back there. We're at Revelation 22, so we're going to put it back in reverse. Then God said, verse 6, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. So you have waters, plural. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters and which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, so the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, verse 9, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place. Let dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. There are three levels of waters here. There's the waters that are under the firmament. Everybody see that? There's the waters that's above the firmament. And then there's the waters that he separates on the firmament, the dry land from the seas. I think it's pretty evident in Scripture that prior to the flood, there had never been a rain. We have no record of rain. The Bible says that a mist came up from the earth, and it watered the earth. So when you think about how can there be a worldwide catastrophic flood, where do we get that much water? Well, I believe the, the answer's right here. 
So we have water under the earth, we have water on the earth, and we have water above the earth in, in the firmament. Um, I don't think Adam and Eve had to worry about being sunburned. Just, just go with me on this, all right? Uh, because they were naked, not ashamed. I don't think they had to worry about sunburn. Because it appears there was a, a vapor cloud that uh, circumvented the earth. And any harmful rays, any ultraviolet rays that would you know, come through the atmosphere was filtered through the moisture and the waters that was in the heavens or above the firmament. Also, we're very familiar about water being on the earth. He divided the earth from the, the sea, so we have dry ground now. And then he said the water under the firmament. If uh, you've ever been in the oil business or you've ever drilled an oil well, then you would know there's an ocean of salt water underneath us. And many times when you're even trying to drill a well for drinking water, if you go too deep, you'll hit salt water, and uh, that will not be good for drinking water, will it? Um, so we know there's water under the earth. We know there's water on the earth. And we know the, there was water in the atmosphere in the heavens around the earth. But when Noah's flood came, and, and I know we'll get to that later, but you have to understand this, I believe, to understand Noah's flood. Because we don't have that water vapor or that, that huge envelopment of moisture around the earth today. It's gone. Where did it go? It fell to the earth because the Bible says, and God opened the windows of heaven. And so all that water that was circumventing the earth now comes upon the earth. It's also raining, and the fountains of the deep broke open. So now what do we have? We have all three of these areas of water now coming upon the earth from below, from above, and what's already on the earth. And that's how we get a wor worldwide catastrophic flood. And this helps explain that right, right at this uh, juncture in, uh, in Scripture. So he's gathered the waters. Now, let me back up here. Remember how the earth started? It was completely covered by water. So when we say, well, in Noah's time, the, the waters covered the earth. Well, the earth was covered by water at the beginning, but God separated those waters, and when the flood came, all those waters came back down, and what happened? The earth was covered by water again. Is anybody getting this? Uh, but it helps us to understand because we can read this, and I can read this, and I think, okay, I got this, but how does it apply when I get over here, and how does it apply when I get over here, and I get over here? So that helps me to understand, you know, some of the things that we, we can understand in, in the sense of what happens. So those three la layers of water, above the earth, on the earth, below the earth. Okay, let's go to verse 11, Genesis 1. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, as the herb that... The, the herb that yields seeds and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind whose seed is is in itself on the earth and so it was and the earth brought forth grass the herb that yields seed according to its kind and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind and God saw that it was good so the evening and the morning were the third day so notice this, we have creation, um, we have water, because the water, the abyss is covering the earth. Now we have light, now God separates the water from the earth, and he calls it what, dry ground or earth. Now we have soul, and now we have plant life. But all the things that happened prior to was necessary for the last to happen, okay? So we had to have water, we had to have light, we have to have soul, so that now we can have plant life. So everything is in a sequence so that one can support the other. Now one of the things that we have here also is that each of these grasses and these herbs and these trees are going to now yield its fruit. So God gave it its start and says now it's up to you to procreate from the seed. And he's going to do the same thing with Adam and Eve later. So he says, I'm going to give you the start, 
But now, it's up to you. And I'll guarantee you, the crabgrass and the weeds are doing a really good job today. You might not get it growing in your yard, but it will grow between the crack of your sidewalk, right? So, he, he, he commissioned creation in as far as the, uh, the plant life. He says, I'm going to give you a start, but you're going to have seed, and there's going to be seed in the fruit, um, and nearly every fruit has the seed inside. There are some fruit that does not have seed inside. Anybody name one? St strawberry. Strawberry has seeds on the outside, not on the inside. Uh, that didn't cost you anything extra. But he, he says every fruit's going to have seed, and now you're going to have to bear and, and grow and procreate and increase by the seed. And most of us know that many plants, and most plants, have more than one seed. Some only have one but uh, in fruit, but it produces multiple fruit. So it, the, the tree itself has a multiple seed. So now plant life is being kicked off. Now look in verse number 14 through 19, and I'm not going to read all this, but um, I, I want to just give you a couple of things I think is interesting. Now we're introduced to signs, seasons, day and night, along with all the celestial bodies, stars, planets, sun, moon. So God creates the plants on the third day, but for the plants to continue, then they're going to need some natural light. So now God introduces to us the celestial bodies, the stars, planets, sun, moon on the fourth day. So that first day, those plants are getting what the light of God, but by the, the, I mean the third day, and by the fourth day, now we have the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, and the heavenly bodies now are created. When I was growing up, my, my great-grandfather and my grandfather, uh, if they were planting the garden, if we were working cattle, um, they used this term. Well, we want to make sure the signs are right. Has anybody ever heard that? We've got to make sure the signs are right. And when I was growing up, I thought, well, you know, I don't know if that's really valid. But the older I get, I think they had something. What do you think? Because it just seems like there are times and signs that over the year humanity has just come up with this idea that I think there's something to signs. And the Bible talks about signs. Um, and, and listen, a lot of the older folks, they had a lot of things that uh, they did. Uh, they, they would plant by the almanac because the almanac was based on moon cycles and different things. Um, my grandfather would plant uh, potatoes uh, on Valentine's Day. I mean, that's when he always planted potatoes. You say, well, that's way back in February. Yeah, and he'd sink them deep in the ground, and that's when he planted them. Uh, so they always had signs and times that they did things, and a lot of times that's where you get what we call today the farmer's almanac. And that was a very popular thing, and they would plant according to, to the farmer's almanac, which was based on the signs of lunar and and uh, different uh, uh, you know things as far as uh, uh, moon phases and and dates and things, but the Lord says signs, seasons, day and night, along with celestial bodies, stars, planets, sun, fourth day. Let's go down to verse twenty. Verse twenty. Now the waters are going to come alive with life. So now we have plant life. Now we have the sun and the seasons. Uh, when we say seasons, we're talking about what? Summer, fall, winter, spring. So now the plants have seasons that they operate through. Um, about probably three or four weeks ago, I planted some squash. And I planted it late. And so I'm reading about squash, and they said you can plant squash, and it will produce until it gets cold or it freezes. So it's one of the um, um, plant varieties, kind of like pumpkins, that they, they will, you know, keep producing. So today I, I brought 
back to the kitchen, this huge sack of squash, uh, back to uh, Roderick and said, here's some squash. So he cooked it for lunch today. It's pretty good, too. And so it's still producing. But there's going to come a time that those leaves, they're, they're going to wither, and they're going to be gone, and they're not going to come back again. The, the only way they're going to come back again is I've got to replant the seed. But there are some plants and trees, obviously, perennials, that you do not have to replant the seed because they'll just go through the seasons, and when the season's over and the right season comes about, uh, they're, they're going to be fruitful. They're going to come back out. They're going to get green. Um, one of the things I'm avoiding uh, and uh, trying to not think about uh, the next season is all the leaves in my yard. Does anybody else have that? And then you turn around and the trees are going through a season and you're going to have to pick up leaves, rake leaves, or uh, hope a strong north wind blows and goes to your neighbor's yard. And then next week the strong south wind will blow and it'll come back with you with more. So uh, when you're out in the country, it doesn't make any difference. It just comes from everywhere. So there are seasons. So the waters come alive, verses 20 uh, through 23. The abundance of living creatures. So this is the first animal life we really have mentioned. Now notice where the first animal life begins. It begins in the waters. Nearly every scientist, even if they're not creationists, even if they believe in evolution, they're going to tell you where, where life began. Where are they going to tell you life began? In the water. I mean, nearly every textbook, every scientist is going to say, Life on earth first began in the water, and then it came out on uh, land. One of the stories I heard, there was a debate, and, uh, and, and a lot of people believe this, that cows came from whales, because whale is actually a mammal, and they believe that life came from the sea, that one time uh, in our vast billions of years, Carl Sagan billions of years that some quail crawled off of the beach and became cows and the guy debating him says that sounds like an utter lie to me <laughs> now some of you get on the way home but uh, anyway so life begins scripturally biblically in the water and that's what most scientists believe so we have this abundance of living creatures Great sea creatures. Now think about all the creatures in the ocean. I mean, those creatures we don't even know about. We're still discovering creatures in the ocean. And I don't know if you've ever seen these deep uh, uh, studies, you know, uh, bathyspheres, and they have a lot of names for them now, where they go down where there is absolutely no light, and there are creatures that they've never seen before. And some of them are... Uh, you know, bioillumination creatures. They, they produce their own light. And uh, so when God said, I'm going to fill the, the oceans and the seas with creatures in the water, how many of you know he did a good job? There's all kind of different creatures in the water. Uh, then birds begin to fly. And God spoke to the creatures in the water and the birds, and he said, be fruitful and multiply. So we know that... Uh, today that they're being fruitful they're multiplying now verses 24 through 25 uh, the beasts of the earth are created the land animals and each according to its kind so you're, you're going to see through the plants uh, the trees the the fish the water that god uses this word kind everybody say kind let me give you a word that we're more familiar with today it's the word species according to their species. Now, this is what we know, it still happens today, that even though you're in the same species, there can be cross-breeding, pollination, whatever you want to call it, that produces different things from the species. If you would go to the fair, and you would go through the hog barn, you're going to have burnt Berkshire pigs, you're going to have Durocks, you're going to have Hamps, you're going to have Yorks, uh, you're going to have all kinds of pigs. They are different colors. Some are floppy ears, some are straight ears. Uh, some have this characteristic, some have that characteristic, but they're all of the same what? 
species. So th this is where we get into a lot of uh, evolutionary thought because people say, well, the reason they're that way is because they evolved that way. Well, in some way, we might say there is a micro truth to that, but it's all the same what species. So we, we don't have any record. We don't have any intermediate uh, fossils. We, we don't have any uh, links that a pig became a horse. Okay? Or a horse became a cow. Now, I have about 100 cows, and some are black, some are red, some have white faces. Uh, they're all different colors. But they're the same species or the same kind. Matter of fact, I had a guy call me today, and he said, Mike, uh, you know, some of our cows inter intermingled. I looked back, and the gate was open. And so I, I called my cattle over. I thought I had them all over, and some of his are red, and all of mine are black. But he says, do you have one red calf? And I said, I do. And I said, that's odd, because I have all black cows, I have a black bull, and I have one red calf. Because this happens pretty often, is that somewhere down the line in the genealogy, there was that gene, and every once in a while, all of my black cows and a black bull will have a different color calf. But it's the same species or the same kind. So I, what I'm trying to tell you is that if you listen to a lot of evolutionists, they're going to say the only way that happened is through you know, billions of years of evolution. But what happens is when <laughs> things in the same species you know, interbreed or intermingle, you will get different things but it's the same species okay so you are a human being and we call this mankind did you catch the last part of it you will produce after your kind so the word kind in the hebrew simply means species so if we're mankind we're of the human species which means we've always been of the human species and monkeys are a different kind. So you did not come from a monkey and you didn't crawl out from the ocean. And my term is you didn't become you through the goo through the zoo, right? You have always been a human being and you were created in the image of God. So when he creates all of these fish and well, and uh, lobsters and crabs and, and um, trees and, and, you know, all of these birds, uh, they are of the species of what he created them to be. So you really have to think about that because if you don't, somebody's going to come in, they're going to slip in and, you know, throw you a curveball. And, and the Bible actually deals with this. So the beasts of the earth, the, the land animals are created, each according to its kind or each according to its species. So hopefully I didn't confuse you too much. There is a variation in species, but they are the same species, and they don't go really one from another. Uh, you say, well, you know, you have horses and you have mules and you have donkeys. I understand that, but they're the same species or type even though there's a variation in between that, and that usually comes from you know, man's uh, interbreeding and creating something through that. And it can happen naturally too, but it's still the same species. Okay, enough of that, Pastor. Now, what we're getting into the next uh, segment, we'll talk about this next time, but I want to kind of preview it. So the next thing he creates, so we're at day six here, and... He's getting ready to create mankind. And he's going to create man in his image. So the image that you and I bear is the image of God. In the next few times we meet, we're, we're going to read that when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, they were used to, in the evening, in the cool of the day, walking with God, but this is what your Bible says. It, it, it indicates that they heard 
the voice of God walking in the garden. How many of you have ever heard a voice walk? But let's tweak this where we can understand it. We're not trying to change Scripture. They heard the Word of God walking in the garden. But in the King James, it says voice. Well, a voice can't walk. And if you heard someone walking, you'd hear their footsteps. But the terminology here is they, they heard the voice walking. Or they heard the Word walking. Now, John 4.24 says, God is a spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. Now, if I ask you where God is, you would probably say, where, where's God not? Because He's everywhere, right? But there was a connection between Adam and Eve where they actually walked with God in the cool of the day in the garden. Now, in the last chapter in Revelation that we said, that, that verse said that we will see God basically face to face. But, but here's, a, here's a paradox here. When Moses said, let me see you, God said, there's no way you can see me and live. Because if you saw me, and let me just put the Mike McCord twist on this, you'd be a crispy critter or something. You know, no man can see me and live. But God has revealed himself to us through the Son, Jesus Christ. So could it be, and I think it's very possible, and there's a word for this that most scholars use, it's called a Christos Christophany, where there is a pre-Bethlehem, not an earthly body, not a human you know, Jesus, but the appearance of God through the appearance of Jesus Christ as what we would know as the Son. And the Bible says, uh, Paul speaking, he says, for we know that that Christ is the expressed image of the invisible God. So when Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden, did they walk with a spirit? Did they walk with someone that they could recognize? Did they walk with someone they could actually see a face? Because in Revelation 22, what did it say? That we shall see the face of God. Now when you get to John chapter 14, Jesus begins by saying this, If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If we're not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. And uh, so one of the disciples said, Lord, I mean, we don't know where you're going. You're saying we're going to be with you uh, when you go, uh, but we, we don't know where you're going. And um, he said, In my Father's house are many mansions. And they begin to say, well, we're not for sure where you're going. And uh, if you would show us the Father, you know, we'd be satisfied. And he says to Thomas, he says, Thomas, have I been with you so long that you don't know who I am? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now, does that mean that, you know, God's not anywhere else in the universe? It doesn't mean that at all. But the only way that we're connecting to God, and this is in the same chapter, no man can come to the Father, what? Except by me or through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So God is a spirit. John 4, 24 says this. And God is not only omniscient, but He's omnipresent. Which means what? He's everywhere at one time. Now, when Paul writes about this, he said this is a mystery. For God was manifest in the flesh, preached unto Gentiles, was received up into glory. And you say, well, wait a minute. That, that's talking about Jesus. But yet, Paul calls him God. And so we have this really mystery. And that's the way Paul begins that verse. Great is the mystery of godliness, for God was. And he begins to list these things. And you say, well, every one of those things refer to Jesus. So this is what we know. God manifests himself through Jesus Christ. And I think we all believe that here. So many believe that when Adam and Eve, after they were created, they had this relationship with Almighty God through what we would know as Jesus Christ, the Son. And we know that Jesus did not just appear in Bethlehem. Because he was the word with the father in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. 
and God created by speaking the Word. And then Paul would later write, he said all things that were created were created by Him and for Him. And guess who he's talking about? He's talking about Jesus. So Jesus is the spoken Word in Genesis chapter 1. And the Holy Spirit hovers and flutters and covers this abyss that has no light, that has no creative uh, land or plants or animals. And then that creation process begins. And then in the last part of that chapter, as it closes out, he said, let us create man in our own image. Okay? So you have the image of God upon you. And there's a Latin phrase for that, and we'll talk about that next time. So it brings us to a couple of conclusions, is if you have the image of God, what is that image that you have? Well, one of the uh, aspects of that image is just as God is threefold in nature, He's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you're threefold in nature too. You have a body, you have a soul, and you have a spirit. But there's only one of you, but you have a body, you have a soul, and you have a spirit. So you're created in the very image of God. Here's another thing to consider as we get into this uh, Genesis study. Why, why does Satan, and we're actually going to preach on this uh, Sunday about uh, uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Uh, why does Satan not like us? One of the reasons he does not like you is because you're created in the very image of God. And every time he looks at Ron, and he looks at me, and he looks at Stephen, guess who's he, who's he reminded of? He's reminded of God. So Jesus was not born in Bethlehem so he could look like us. We were born because we look like him. Right? Because he's pre-existent before Bethlehem. So now we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. And now we are created in the image of God. And so there's immediately a conflict. Actually, there's more than one. Is because Satan doesn't like you and he doesn't like me. It's because we are created in the very image of God. And another problem is he got kicked out of heaven and you're, you're kind of... Uh, on his hit list, right? How, how many you know when you go through this life, th there's a lot of pitfalls and there's a lot of trouble and that's because you have an enemy and you live in a fallen world. Oh, let's stop there. Stay with me. We're, we're, we're done. 